Hey, happy March, friends. It's great to be with all of you again. Uh, you know, I, I love this time of year. I mean, this is the, the beginning of the bee season for beekeepers. You know, if you're in the southern part of the United States, you know, uh, your bees are raising drones, flowers are blooming, your bees are starting to grow. If you're in the northern part of the United States, your bees are still starting to brood up now that the days are a little bit longer. So it's just a super exciting time of year. I love, love, love talking about bees in March and April, because there's just so much to do. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Blake. I'm I'm uh, one of the owners of the Bee Supply, and I'm also a, a beekeeper. I've been keeping bees for about 20 years. I was a small-scale beekeeper, then a sideline beekeeper, then a commercial beekeeper. And so um, I've kind of played in all aspects of the beekeeping world and uh, still own and operate a commercial beekeeping company um, in addition to uh, working with the Bee Supply. So... And we've got a lot of wonderful things to go over tonight, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right in. Um, we have uh, some bees still available, so if you haven't ordered your bees yet, we do still have some of those available. So we have um, our 2022 pricing still in effect. So jump in there now, and uh, we we hope to not raise prices, but there is a lot of kind of chaos going on in the uh, bee supply uh, side of of in the United States right now. So there's a potential shortage of honeybees this year. I'll kind of get into that and what's going on there in just a minute. Um, but uh, but our 2022 price is still in effect and we still have our 14 day guarantee. So if anything goes wrong with your bees in 14 days, bring them back, we'll give you a new beehive. So um, still some time to take advantage of all that. Uh, we have this really cool new product in stock. Um, so this is something that we actually talked about in our last month's uh, monthly buzz. Uh, but this is the easy C veil system. So we have these in stock and these are super cool because you basically buy this kit and then you attach this uh, kind of this plexiglass window to any existing veil. And it makes it super clear seeing out that seeing out of that veil. So it makes finding queens easier, seeing frames, what's going on in the frames easier, seeing eggs easier. So if you ever find that uh, screen kind of annoying that's in your face, uh, that that dark screen, this fixes that problem. So um, I'm super eager to hear some of your feedback on that after you try it. Uh, we also have some spring splits classes coming up. So uh, March 11th to March 18th are our in-person classes in Blue Ridge and Dayton. If you uh, want to take a virtual class, we have that option for you as well. So it's a great time of year to learn about making splits. You may have some hives that are too strong right now, which is always a great problem. Uh, but, you know, now is the time to learn about splits a month or so or two before you actually need to make them. Uh, a quick update, you know, coming soon to Round Rock is our our new newest bee supply store. So we're almost there. We're installing the sign. We're putting in shelving. It's getting really, really close. Uh, we will be updating all of you the instant we have a grand opening date. You can go ahead and pre-order bees for pickup. And, uh, and so that's available on the website now. And then we are, we're getting really, really close to wrapping up that project and getting it open. Certainly later than we had wanted, uh, hit several delays, but, but we are almost there. A quick, really, a quick side note, if you're in any of our stores, you can pick up these free educational resources. One is our Getting Started Guide that kind of walks you through how to install a Nook, package a single, what you should do your first month home. Uh, the concept is kind of... Uh, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the first time you have a baby, here's what you do when you get your baby home. <laughs> That's kind of the the uh, line of thinking we went down as we uh, built out this uh, booklet. The other is just our monthly tips. And we're actually updating this uh, at the moment, but we still have some of these available. But our new version will hopefully come out in the next month or two. Um, next up, we have the magazine. Sherry, do you want to tell us what's going on in the magazine this month? It's it's phenomenal. I, I love that cover. It's it's so, so cool. Um, tell us what's going on in this month's magazine. Uh, isn't that cool? So this guy, um, Willie, is out of Minnesota, and that's actually marshland. And we don't think about that in Minnesota, but he's got that beer, that pier deck that goes out to his bees. How cool is that? That's how I want to keep bees, right? I love it. 
Wouldn't it be nice if it were floating for some of those moments that we have we have a little more rain than we're supposed yeah, to? Yeah, we've we've run bees in Minnesota uh, for several <laughs> years, um, and uh, it, I, it, it's super super honey. Love the honey from Minnesota, but Isn't I'm that not, awesome. I, yeah, that marshland is crazy. Yeah, great global. It honey. is. I think beautiful picture, and that just reminds me to say, if you've got a great picture, please send it to me. You never know; it may end up on the cover. Um, editor at dbsupply.com. Please, please, please. So this issue is packed. You know, I say that every month. This one's 75 pages. I think I, I went over the mark on that. And I don't tell you that to intimidate you, but just to, there is so much, just like Blake was saying, March and April, we are B season. Across the nation, almost everyone is seeing something that's bee season. So please download, if you're having trouble viewing it on a device, okay, download it, use the little download symbol that's on there. And it's gonna be much easier for you to scroll through the pages. Plus you can peek back at it on your break time. Wink, wink, don't tell your boss that that's what you're doing, but you, it really does make it much easier to see. So a couple of articles I wanna point out this month, Blake, is say uh, you did two on splits. We kind of you divided it up this month. One on things you should know, and the other I'm ready to make splits. So that really kind of gives you the what have I what do I got to do to get ready? And then here you go, I'm ready, which is super. And then swarms. Oh, we are swarm season, swarm season. So there's actually three different concurrent articles in there on swarms. We've got a um, where did I put it here? Prevention. And then there's a video if you wrote, you put in there for me on uh, what to look for to swarms getting ready to happen. And then step by step on trapping swarms. That's a James Elam. But uh, step by step on, and y'all get to all laugh at me because he makes fun of me in that article. Um, go ahead, go on there and, and laugh at me just like he did. <laughs> there we go. That's the, my next one. Article snapshot. Go ahead to that blank. Super. So this isn't really an article. Um, and Blake, I know that you've got this in your in your program. I think you told me, send me that over. This I'm obsessed with it, I think was your words. This is a super cool find. It is a clickable link to go in and watch the nation's first leaf and first bloom indices, okay? How cool is that? It's real time, actually. It's real time. So I want you to do that. Go in and click on the map. But let me tell you what that's going to do for you. This is, again, it's not an article, but this is a tool that you can use as a, what do I need to be doing in my bees? Because if I see, and, and we are in our area, we're in that, we're ahead of the schedule. We're, we're three weeks, I think, ahead of schedule. Some places it says, um, you know, eight, eight days or some, some are behind. Southern California, where the blue is there, you might cannot can see on your screen, they're behind schedule. So what does that really mean to me as a beekeeper? If I'm ahead of schedule, means I need to get my, my supers out, get them ready, because we're going to be ahead of the game on when nectar flow starts. One thing begets another. So that's what we need to be looking for. If I'm behind, if I'm in that Southern um, West, West version, where Southern California, Utah, and so forth, I might need to still be feeding. These bees are staying in their hives longer. Their forage isn't what we would like for it to be. So they're consuming more. So you need to be prepared to be feeding. So that map is gonna help you decide where I need to be in this part of the month. I just think it's a coop, super cool resource that we can, We I may even run it again this next month on, in April because it's just such a neat little click it to have handy. All right, Blake, that's all I got. Love it. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome. Great month. Great addition this month, as always. So, um, okay. So many thanks to Sherry there for that. Um, so quick California update, you know, and um, I'm not sure what's going on in my video. My my arm keeps uh, chopping off. I do have I do have two arms here, but um this uh the the, the green screen keeps chopping off my arm. So um uh, the uh, California update. So as you guys know, uh, I talked about it in our last monthly buzz, you know, we've been out in California putting other people's bees into almonds. It's, it's you know, the biggest pollination event in the world. And uh, I always get a lot of great feedback when we talk about 
um, the California almonds and what's what's going on out there. Everyone's always super interested to hear more about California almonds and how it works. So I just try to give you guys a little snapshot of what we're doing in our operation throughout the year. And in April, we'll be talking a lot about, hey, you know, we're, we're splitting, we're building bees. We'll show lots of pictures and videos of that. Uh, but in California, I mean, just check this out. I mean, it's so beautiful out there when the almonds are in bloom. I mean, you can see this is this is an almond orchard in full bloom and just absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, just just stunning. Um, now, as amazing and stunning as that is, this is some of what we've been seeing uh, the past couple of weeks, which is really, I feel like after COVID and uh, everything that we've experienced and seen in the past couple of years, the word unprecedented is kind of overused. <laughs> but uh, but this is kind of unprecedented for California, what we're seeing out there. Um, we're seeing snow in northern Cal in the northern California orchards and then just um, extreme wet and cold uh, in the rest of the, the in the rest of the Central Valley. I mean, usually this time of year, you know, in mid-February to early March, it's uh, warm, not that wet. Uh, days are in the mid 60s to mid 70s. Um, but this is what we're seeing. I mean, snow, snow in California, I mean, LA got snow. Um, and so it's just kind of unbelievably cold, unbelievably wet. Uh, the bees haven't flown in, in 10 days in some cases, which again is very unusual. It's pretty devastating for the almond growers. Um, obviously it's not great for the bees either. They're not able to get out and forage and grow uh, like we would like them to and so that's why i was talking about you know we may see some issues with the availability of bees this year not because it's killing beehives but just because bees aren't growing as much as they normally do um uh because <laughs> they're under snow um, they're still growing unbelievably i mean if you go look at these hives they're still brooding up they're still growing uh, but everything is going to be a little bit later this year even though a lot of the u.s is early uh, where all the bees are managed and where all the bees are right now is cold and behind. So that will have a bit of an effect this year. Uh, for the almond growers, you know, it will certainly damage their crop. Uh, they're, you know, I don't want to speak for the almond industry, but this probably really damage the crop. Um, this will probably really damage the uh, the crop. And as a result, um, you know, it will, uh... so as a result, you know, it, it could lower the supply of almonds and raise the price back up. And hopefully most of them, and most of them do have insurance for things like this. So anyway, quick little update there. So back here in Texas, you know, we are super busy prepping uh, to build nooks, to build single story hives, you know, uh, to do packages. So our crews are busy building nook boxes. Uh, sometimes they uh, uh, wrap uh, things other than nook boxes as they're getting ready. Uh, this is just a quick little video of um, what we have going on um, out in our uh, primary location. So these are some of our guys and they are unloading a few truckloads of boxes that uh, we will be building hives into. But you can just kind of see in the background, I mean, we just have equipment and supplies stacked everywhere. And all this is going to be filled with bees in uh, starting in mid-March, and it'll all be full by mid-April. Um, and then we'll start checkbacks and feeding and deliveries and, and all of that. So we just have... Um, thousands of, of hives to build. And so um, so we'll be staying very busy. And like I said, we'll, we'll be showing you updates on all of this uh, once we get into April. So a lot of work to do. This is the busy season, it's, it's here. Okay, so March tips. Um, before we do that, uh, we are, I forgot to throw in my uh, in the bee yard slide. So um, we're going to jump out into the bee yard and see what's going on in the bees. 
and then we'll come back in here and uh, and then resume our monthly tips uh, for March. So I will see you in the bee yard. Hey guys, so it's great to be back in the bee yard. The last uh, couple of um, webinars I've been in California or the weather's been terrible because it was winter and I'm back in the bee yard and uh, boy, it's great to be out here. I mean, spring is here if you're from Texas um, and if you're across much of the south, spring is here. And we're gonna talk about this. I'm gonna show you some really cool maps and share is as well uh, that kind of show the progress of spring this year. Um, if you're from the west, <laughs> the west coast area, okay, uh, spring isn't looking so hot right now. And, and uh, a lot of this um, central and uh, northeastern area is in the middle of a huge blizzard. So we'll kind of talk about all that in a minute. But um, if you're from the south, you know what I mean. Spring is here. Uh, if you are from the north or the west, um, I guess you can watch this and uh, uh, anticipate what's coming, hopefully, for you guys in the coming weeks. But um, we're going to dive into the bees today. Um, it's a bit of an overcast day today, but uh, it's warm. It's in the mid to upper 60s. Uh, the bees are bringing in tons of pollen, which is super cool to see. And then I'm actually going to turn the camera around for you guys, um, just because I think it's so cool to see. Um, if you look at the field over there, uh, you see the purple. That is a uh, henbit, and it is just blooming like crazy. So you can see that henbit is blooming, there's a whole field of it. And then right in front of it, I noticed there's actually a couple of um, plum trees, wild plum trees, and they are um, just about to start blooming. So uh, things are blooming. It's been blooming for a few weeks here in North Texas. If you're in the south, Southeast Texas or you know, you've, you know, anywhere within a couple hundred miles of the Gulf Coast, you probably have gotten pollen for quite some time now. So the bees are in a period of rapid buildup. You know, even if you're in an area that's colder, you know, the days are getting longer and the bees are starting to brood up some. And that's, that's awesome. You know, we're, we're approaching spring or heading into spring um, rapidly. So we're gonna take a look at some things uh, in the bee yard uh, to keep, you know, as we're coming out of winter. So we're gonna look at uh, how much brood they have. We may reverse some boxes and just do a general early spring checkup. Um, uh, as we as we look at the bees, so let's dive in. All right, so let's tackle this uh, this monster hive here. So this this hive overwintered with the it has three deep boxes. So this was a really strong hive going into winter, and and uh, you know so it had three boxes that were all pretty full of bees and honey. I would say two of the boxes were pretty full of bees, and then another box was mostly full of honey. So we. We just left it three deep. So I usually would try to reduce it down to just two boxes going into winter. But this one was super strong. And so it's okay to leave it, you know, three boxes if they're, you know, if they all have quite a bit of bees in it. So we left it. Um, I might go ahead and pull it down to just two boxes today. Let's just see how they're looking. So right off the bat, I can see that uh, I've got bees peeking at me through the inner cover, which is always a good thing to see. We've got some bees on the inner cover, which is cool. And then I've got several frames of bees, you know, looking down at the top here. So I'm gonna give them some smoke and then see what we got going on. So looking between the frames, you know, I can see that they're pretty much just full of honey. You know, I don't see a lot of brood looking down between the frames. I think this top box is just a box full of, whoa, full of honey, yeah. So you can see they've just got gobs and gobs of honey up here. <laughs> so, uh, so this top box, it's got some bees in it, but it's mostly just a box completely full of honey. So I'm gonna set it aside. Oh, wow. Yep, yep, it's full of honey. Oh, very full. So. That's good, certainly no food needed here. Um, the next box has got one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven frames of bees in it. And again, I always just calculate that by looking down between the frames and you can quickly count how many frames of bees there are uh, in the hive. So that's a great estimation of strength is if you count between all the frames, um, see how many frames of bees there are and then total them up across the whole hive, you know, it's a good estimation of uh, the, the overall strength. So I am uh, gonna start with the second frame here. 
and see what we have going on kind of as we're getting down into this primary brood nest area. Ah, oh, so cool. Look at this. How cool is this? I mean, there's nothing like in the early spring just seeing all this fresh new brood in a hive. So, you know, we've got pollen, we've got honey up here in the corners. We've got pollen, a beautiful ring of pollen, um, beautiful frame of brood. You know, this hive just is meeting expectations. So I'm gonna set that frame aside. Um, the outside frame here, I don't usually look at the outside frame. I usually just leave it be, but I'm gonna take a quick, pit, quick, ugh, quick peek. So worth doing. This is pretty much a frame of uh, a frame of pollen. So you can see the uh, the pollen, of course, the honey around the edges, um, and then you've got this multicolored pollen, mostly uh, mostly kind of that yellow, a little bit of orange, um, probably some from henbit, some from the plum starting to bloom. Uh, dandelion is often that darker colored pollen, but uh, you know, beautiful frame of pollen exactly what I want to see this time of year. Notice I don't really have pollen patties on this hive. Uh, we'll talk about pollen patties um, a different time. You know, usually we feed those in the fall, but uh, the only time I really feed them in the spring is if, it's, if there's a week to 10 days of cold and the bees can't get out and forage, then I might give them a pollen patty because with all this brood in the hive, um, without pollen for 10 days, they'll start cannibalizing the brood. So if I've got like a 10 day cold front where it's not over about 55 degrees and the bees can't get out and fly, then I'll throw some pollen patties on. But that doesn't all usually happen, but if it does, a pollen patty doesn't hurt. So I'll let you guys see if you can uh, spot the queen on this frame. But uh, the queen is on this frame. She's looking absolutely beautiful. So if you haven't seen her yet, she's right here. So she is, looks great. We'll probably go ahead and requeen in April. We'll requeen all these hives because they haven't been requeened since last year. So in our April webinar, we'll talk about requeening and uh, we'll, put, we'll do a demonstration out in the bee yard on, uh, on how to requeen. So um, this next frame, <laughs> uh, I left it in here because it happens and somehow, a medium frame uh, got uh, left in a deep box. And so you can see what happens when you have a medium frame stuck in a deep box. The bees will uh, turn it into a deep frame. <laughs> so the interesting thing is usually when they draw out excess comb, it's drone comb. And so all that comb there at the bottom of this frame, all of this, this is all drone, drone brood. When they draw out this excess comb or an extra sheet of comb, it's almost always drone comb. So you can see the drone, these are actually uh, drone cells. You can see they're kind of larger, especially these down here. They're larger and bumpier than the worker bee cells. What some beekeepers do, and it's really not a bad idea, um, what some beekeepers do is they'll actually do this, uh, even commercial beekeepers, they'll do this intentionally. They'll have a, uh, a medium frame and a deep box. They might have a couple of these. And then every time they go into the bee yard, um, the bees will have drawn out fresh drone comb and then the queen will lay drones in it. And then they'll just scrape it off and throw it away. And uh, you know, the varroa mites are more attracted to the drone brood. And so you tend to, when you scrape it off and throw it away each trip, you're getting rid of a decent chunk of the varroa mites in the hive. Uh, it's certainly not enough to fully control varroa mites, but it's not a, it's not a terrible thing to do to uh, help reduce down your varroa mite uh, levels in addition to other forms of management. So, I mean, this hive is just uh, really beautiful. I mean, I'm not going to go through every frame, but I mean, it's got several frames of brood. The bees aren't terribly happy because, you know, it's uh, cloudy out here. But they've got several frames of brood in here. Uh, looks like they've got about one, two, three, four, five about six frames of brood in this box. We'll take a really quick peek in the bottom box. I'm not expecting them to have much down there, but about the time I go expecting something is when the bees will uh, surprise me every time. So let's take a quick, quick peek in the very bottom box and just see if I'm missing anything down there. 
Oh, yeah, see? I should just keep my mouth shut until I uh, actually do finish an inspection. Because <laughs> they've actually got, uh, this bottom box is pretty stinking full too. I wasn't expecting them to be this strong. So do as I say, not as I do. Uh, I usually recommend starting on the outside and pulling the frame out instead of starting in the middle. But if I'm in a hurry, I will often pull a frame right out of the middle. I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, you think I haven't like seen this a thousand times like I have, but I just, I find it cool every time. I'm trying to get the angle right, but this frame is pretty much completely full of larva. Um, you can kind of see at the top center there, um, the lighting isn't quite good enough to get a great shot of it, but the uh, top center there is just uh, full of lar older larva and uh, the bottom's full of larva. So this is a frame completely full of larva. It looks like in total down here, they've got, let's see how many frames are brewed. They've got, that's all nectar. So I, if you're in a hurry, you can often look between the frames and kind of count frames of brood because those brood, uh, the cat brood kind of sticks out a little bit and sometimes you can kind of see it down between the frames. So they've got one, two, three, four frames of brood down here and about six frames of brood up top. So this hive is a good problem because they've already got, you know, nine to 10 frames of brood and today is March 1st. So, you know, we're a month from being able to get mated queens to make a split. So this hive, there's a good chance it's gonna swarm before April 1st, let's say, when we can get queens. They're already at, you know, nine to 10 frames of brood. So again, it, it's a problem, but it's a good problem. So what I'm going to do with a hive like this is um, I'm going to uh, do a couple different things. Um, I don't wanna to try to split right now. You could, you could take this hive, go ahead and split, and let them raise their own queens but it's too early to do that. There's not often enough drones to successfully mate with a queen. I don't like letting queens open mate until I see, um, you know, or I don't like to make a split and let them raise their own queen until I'm seeing adult drones in the hive, um, or at the very least, um, adult drones hatching out. Because even after a drone hatches, it still takes a drone two weeks to be mature enough to mate with the queen after it's hatched. I'm not seeing drones in this hive. I'm seeing some drone brood, so I'm getting there, um, but not a lot. I mean, I'm seeing like a dozen drone, you know, this whole hive might have 20 drone cells, and this is a very strong hive. So it's just too early to let the bees successfully raise their own queen. So if, if splitting and letting them raise their own queen isn't an option, which again, in general is not something I recommend in March anyway, then my other option is to try to give them plenty of room so that they don't swarm. Now they've already got three boxes, right? So that that's, should be enough to prevent swarming. But to be extra safe, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take a medium box and I'm gonna put it underneath this bottom deep box. So um, I don't have one out here uh, right now. Actually, um, hang on, I'm gonna go grab one. I'll be right back. Okay, never mind. I, <laughs> I thought I had a dead out over here with a medium on it, but opened it up and it was full of bees. So I'm gonna go back to the shop and I'm gonna get a, uh, a medium box of empty comb and I'm gonna put it underneath this deep box. Bees are very slow to swarm if you have extra space underneath the brood boxes. So I'm gonna get a medium box, a shallow box would work too, that's full of empty frames, and I'm gonna put it underneath this deep box and then stack all these right back up on top. And uh, that combined with the extra deep box that I already have on top should give them plenty of space and theoretically should prevent them from swarming um, before I can get queens and make a split. So put a medium box underneath, you can put an empty box up on top as well, 
With a really strong hive like this, it's okay to give them a surplus of room and it's gonna keep them from swarming before you get queens to make a split. I wanna take a quick look at this hive because I saw something in it earlier. Um, about half the time when I make these videos, um, I, well, <laughs> about 90% of the time, I don't actually know what I'm going to say until I open up the hive and I'm just kind of giving a um, real life commentary on what I'm seeing in the hive and what to do about it. Uh, about 10% of the time I'll like crack it open real quick and see what's coming before I open it. But um, I cracked this one up real quick and I saw something I wanted to show you guys. It's a good, it's a really good hive. Um, you know, it's full of bees. Um, these are our Texas 5000 bees and uh, they overwintered really, really well. I've got pretty much a box full of honey. This one had uh, was a little high with varroa mites, and so we went ahead and did the uh, Apivar treatment. You can see we've got the strips in, in this, two strips in the top box, two strips in the bottom box. March is a really good time to treat for mites. If you've got high mite loads, I highly recommend you check out some of our videos on how to test for mites, uh, because March, they don't have a ton of brood in most cases, but they are brooding up and you still got time to get a treatment started and finished before you get anywhere close to the honey flow. So definitely plan on testing for varroa mites and, uh, and getting that treatment done in March. But what this hive had, if you check it out, check it out. this is what a lot of people have questions about. You've got this burr comb um, all on the top bars and you've got this white larva that you've exposed as you've broken open uh, these, this box and this is drone brood and it's super common to see especially especially in the spring that uh, you know the bees are starting to rear drones and a super common place for them to do that is on the top bars between the boxes and when you break the boxes open you expose that that drone brood. So I want to see if I can give you guys a bit of a closer view because this is really a helpful thing to be aware of as a beekeeper. Um, as you are uh, going through your hive, when you see this drone brood, pardon my lack of camera skills, but when you see this drone brood, number one, it's a good sign. It means that your hive is healthy and strong enough to start rearing drones. And then um, secondarily, it means that uh, the bees have just set up a great rough gauge uh, for you to check your varroa mite levels. So when I see this drone brood in a hive, between the frames, I always look at these larvae. You know, you can move them with your hive tool, you can pick them up, you can look at them in your hand, um, and see if you see any varroa mites on them. Now unfortunately, these drone larvae aren't going to survive. Uh, the bees will clean them out once you've opened the box. But I don't want to see varroa, mite, uh, varroa mites on these larvae. Now remember, varroa like drone larvae and drone brood more than worker bee brood. So usually if they, um, usually they'll migrate to this drone brood first. And so it's not, a, uh, it's not as good as doing a um, sugar test or an alcohol wash. But you know, if I'm looking at these drone, looking at these larvae, and I'm seeing varroa mites all over them, that's a problem. If I'm not seeing any, that's a great sign. So here's one that does have a varroa mite on it. So if you see this little larva right on the tip of it there, let's see if I can get into the camera. Um, that little that little speck, that's a varroa mite. So you'll it's pretty obvious. You'll see it crawling around, and uh, and so again, it's not, a, it's not a great scientific test, but you know, if I'm only seeing, if I'm digging through 10 or 15 of these, and I'm only seeing zero or one, maybe two uh, varroa mites, I'm, I'm not that concerned. If I'm seeing like, oh wow, every other larva has a varroa mite on it, okay, now I'm a little more concerned. So here's a piece of, uh, here's a piece of drone brood, and you can see right here, you know, there's that, uh, see if I can focus in on it a little bit. There's that little speck. So you can see that, that varroa mite right there. On, you can see him crawling around. 
right there on that drone brood. So again, I probably went through 10 or 15 of these little cells and I found two. Uh, we're already treating this, mite, this uh, hive. We already found a bit of a mite issue. Um, so, you know, we're already, we've already got a treatment underway, so I'm not too concerned about it. But, uh, you know, if you see two or three or four varroa mites between the frames, you know, it's a good idea to do a, an actual realistic test and see if you have a bigger problem or not. Okay, so what should you do with a smaller, weaker hive coming out of winter? And my response to that is usually, number one, uh, why is it small, why is it weak? And is it small and weak because it's queenless? And if they're queenless, you know, and you're coming out of winter and you're still of weeks or months away from being able to get a new queen, I usually just combine it with another hive because if it, you know, if, it, if it's queenless, again, there's really no hope for it if you're nowhere close to getting a new queen. They aren't gonna raise their own this early in the year. Um, I, I would pretty much just give up on it. So this hive has really no bees in the top box. And... <laughs> like one and a half frames of bees in the bottom box. So the audio cuts out right here, so I'm just going to finish uh, narrating it just a little bit so you guys can uh, get the, the rest of the picture. But, uh, but this hive was uh, really weak, you know, maybe two frames of bees. And so what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see how much brood they have and if they have a queen. Because if they've got a good laying queen and they've got a decent amount of brood, which you can see this hive does have some brood, uh, it might be worth trying to save it. So they've got really a one good frame of brood in the middle. And then uh, as you'll see, they've got about a half a frame of brood on this frame and about a half a frame of brood on the, the other frame. The queen was there, she was laying and, and they had uh, some decent pollen. Uh, the brood looked healthy. Um, and, and so as you'll see in this frame, um, they actually had uh, a significant amount of pollen uh, for a hive this week. So they had a great band of pollen. They had eggs, larvae, cat brood. They were just really short on bees. They really just kind of declined down in strength throughout the winter. And so, uh, you know, if, if for a commercial beekeeper, <laughs> you know, we would we would combine this hive or shake the bees out and move on and not think twice. But, you know, if you're a small scale beekeeper and this is one hive out of only five that you have or two that you have, um, you can give them some time. And there's a good chance this early in the year They've made it this far. They've got plenty of honey. They've got a good laying queen. They've got brood. They'll probably actually pull through. So what I would do with a hive like this is I would plan on requeening it because, you know, good queen's not great because they're shut down this small over the winter. So in early April, I would requeen it. I would also give it a frame of brood from that really strong hive that we saw. So I'd take a frame of brood, put it in the middle to give them a bit of a boost requeen them in April. And there's a good chance that this hive, by the time the honey flow starts, will be one to two boxes full of bees and and will uh, end up being a good hive. So, so if they've made it this far uh, and they've survived for this long, then you can just go ahead and give them a shot and see if they make it all the way. If they're still queenless or if they are queenless or if the brood looks really bad, it, if it's just you know less than a half a frame of brood or so, probably time to combine it and and they aren't going to make it but in in this case um it's it's not a bad thing to uh go ahead and see if they'll pull through okay so now that we're back from the bee yard you know hopefully that was helpful um we have a lot of march tips to go over you saw in the video you know all that beautiful purple hen bit uh that's just blooming like crazy and uh, depending on where you are, there's all sorts of things blooming. I mean, it's really hard to narrow down. You've got mustards are blooming, dandelions are blooming, and the uh, elms are blooming. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of everything, you know, blackberries, dewberries, uh, you know, wild fruit trees are blooming, and domestic fruit trees are blooming, um, depending on where you are. So lots of blooms in the southern half of the United States. Um, I love, love this. So Sherry talked about the map that, that we're starting to use. Um, they also give a live, uh, or, or I think it's every uh, few days, they do a spring update. And I love this. Here's what it says. 
spring leaf out continues to spread north, arriving several days to weeks earlier than average in much of the southeast, lower Midwest, and Mid-Atlantic. Um, and by the way, so for like Texas, uh, you know, we are two to three weeks ahead of schedule as far as blooms. Um, Oklahoma City is nine days early. St. Louis is 16 days early. New York City is 32 days early. However, much of Southern California and Arizona are days to over a week late, while the coastal Northwest is days to weeks early. Phoenix, Arizona is a week late. Seattle, Washington is a week early. So the spring bloom has arrived in Southern states, days to weeks early in the Southeast, and days to over a week late in the Southwest. Spring bloom is 19 days early in Atlanta, Georgia, eight days late in Phoenix, Arizona. So I love this because it really just gives you a pretty good overview of what I'm seeing. Uh, and, and we're seeing that in most of the country, especially in the South, especially in Texas, uh, we are very early. Uh, but really the whole East Coast even is is very early. And this is the map that Sherry showed. And this is a little bit more zoomed up. And again, you can see this red. This is kind of the, the spring march north. You know, this is where spring has hit. Um, and then the blue is where it's it's really behind. And uh, and so you can kind of zoom in on this map. You can see up in Washington, there's some red. Uh, a lot of the U.S., of course, is still in. in uh, there's We're not anywhere close to bloom or leaf out. Uh, but in these areas, we're we're there. And so we'll start incorporating these maps more and more as we kind of talk about spring and what's and what's going on there. Inside March hives, I'm seeing lots of brood. I mean, I'm seeing this in northern hives. I'm seeing it in southern hives. I'm seeing it on the west coast. Uh, you know, the bees are brooding up. Now, how much they're brooding up certainly depends on where you are. You know, in southeast Texas, you know, th there, there's hives with 10 frames of brood. Uh, you know, what, even in North Texas, where I live, you know, we just saw out in the bee yard, there's a strong hive that's got 10 frames of brood um, and, and kind of everywhere in between. So, but bees are definitely brooding up now that the uh, days are getting longer. Bees are quickly brooding up. So um, feeding syrup, uh, you know, we're seeing that, uh, you know, you need to feed to maintain at least 20 pounds of stores for a hive that's at least one deep box full of bees through March and through April if you don't have a lot of blooms. I would continue feeding one-to-one -one sugar syrup um, if, if you need feed. And, and even if you're in an area that does have a lot of bloom, you may still need to feed this syrup because oftentimes bees are growing at a pace that is uh, outpacing the natural nectar that they're able to bring in. So um, so make sure that you check and are maintaining those 20 pounds of stores. Again, the bees may be able to do that naturally, but then they may also need your assistance to do that successfully. I recommend using a division board feeder, feeder or top feeder rather than an entrance feeder, just because bees can be pretty robby this time of year. And it's helpful to have that syrup sealed up inside the hive rather than on the front of the hive. And then check two or three times through March to ensure that they have sufficient food. Uh, feeding splits, new hives, nooks, and packages, a lot of you are going to be buying new bees this spring. Um, we're going to be talking a lot a, a lot more about this in April, but I want to mention it to go ahead and get your mind thinking about this uh, now. But, um, you know, your first step when you get new bees home is to feed one-to-one -one syrup until the first brood box is 80% full of bees and draw them comb. You know, brand new hive, it takes a lot of resources. They have a lot of work to do, a lot of comb to draw. And so feeding them that one-to-one -one syrup as soon as you get them home is really important. Step two is to add a second brood box and feed one-to-one -one syrup until the second box is 80% full of drawn comb. Step three is if it's before mid-June, add a honey super and stop feeding. Um, and then the goal is to balance feeding um, to help bees draw out comb, but not fill up the brood nest so much that the queen can't lay. And so we'll, again, we'll talk more about all that in, in April. But, you know, your goal is to feed that one-to-one -one syrup, make sure the bees are growing, and then make sure that as you're going through looking at your new beehive, there's still lots of open cells in the middle frames of the brood nest for the queen to lay eggs. Pollen patties in March, it's largely unnecessary at this point in the southern half of the U.S., still helpful in the northern half. You know, watch for those cold weeks and feed pollen patties as needed. A really good example of this is what's going on in California right now. You know, we've got 10 days where the bees aren't able to even get out and forage, and yet they brooded up. They've got 
three, four, five, six, seven frames of brood. And now suddenly they can't fly for 10 days because it's too cold. What's going to happen is they're going to run out of pollen and they're going to start cannibalizing eggs and larvae because they don't have the resources to feed them. That's going to slow that hive down from a growth perspective. So um, it, it's ideal to avoid that. And so if you have these cold weeks where the bees can't get out and forage yet, they've already started to brood up, a pollen patty or two can really be helpful in, in preventing that cannibalization of brood. Again, in most cases, it doesn't happen, especially in the southern the other half of the U.S. Northern half, it's a bit more common. You know, you can kind of have those cold, you know, a warm week where the bees really forage and bring in pollen and brood up and then shut down for a week. And a pollen patty can kind of help even out that brood production. Varroa mites. So everybody's favorite topic, but uh, March is a really important time to test for varroa mites. Uh, it's a perfect time to treat for varroa mites if you're planning on treating because Again, your hive still doesn't have their maximum amount of brood, and all varroa mite treatments are more effective when you have less brood in the hive. Um, it's also a great time to test because your hives are kind of starting to break cluster on warm days, and you can do a varroa mite test. So test, if you have more than two mites per 100 bees, March is the perfect time to treat. As a reminder, um, for treatment options and how to treat, I always recommend you Google the Honeybee Health Coalition Varroa, and they've got a fantastic tool kind of a quiz and it'll kind of walk you through uh, what you can treat, how to treat, etc. So this is a good problem to have when your hive is crowded and is threatening to swarm in March. It, it, it's, it's a common problem and I often see both extremes, you know, and, and we kind of saw it out in the bee yard, right? We kind of have these little hives that um, are, are not growing well and we have to, um, we do have to step in and treat. I'm sorry, so do have to step in and, and help them grow. Um, or we have these super hives that are super strong and we have to take action or they're gonna swarm. So when the top box is 80% full, it's time to take action to prevent swarming. Now a caveat I'm gonna throw in here is if the top and bottom box are more than 80% full, if your bees have all just moved up, then you may need to just reverse boxes. We talked about that quite a bit in our February webinar. Um, but if you're if you're if your top box is 80 percent full and your bottom box is mostly empty, just reverse them. Um, and then when that top box becomes 80 percent full, now you need to think about splitting or adding boxes. But if both of your boxes are 80 percent full, kind of like we saw in that monster hive in the bee yard, you've got three options. You can split them. Don't really recommend that because it's hard to find the queens this time of year. You can add boxes, which we were going to do with that monster hive out in the bee yard. Um, or you can equalize, which works phenomenally well too. You can take frames of brood from that really strong hive, frames of cat brood, and then you can transfer them to your weaker hives. And, and this is a great way to reduce the strength and prevent swarming on that big strong hive and boost up weaker hives. So my preferred method is to equalize my bee yard and spread that brood around. Um, my second option would be to add boxes to the biggest, strongest hives. My third option would be to make a split. Now, once you get uh, once you get queens available, you know, in two or three weeks, you can certainly make a split. That works great, but it's just still hard to find in early March. A couple quick notes for equalizing brood. A couple pointers to keep in mind. One, um, I like to give cat frames of cat brood instead of open larva to weaker hives because that's going to, it's going to hatch faster. We're resulting in a quicker, uh, pop, you know, faster population growth. And then uh, it's also less work for that weak hive. You know, if you give them a frame of open larva, they have to put a ton of work into raising that larva. So I like to give them frames of cat brood. Always put the frames of cat brood in the middle of the weaker hive. You want them in the very middle where all the bees are clustered. They've got to keep it warm. And I wouldn't give them more than one frame at a time because, again, they need enough bees to keep it warm during these colder nights. So if you give them two or three frames of brood, they're not going to be able to keep it warm. And on these cold nights, it's going to get it's going to freeze. So um, another common problem a lot of people have is excess old honey on their hives. And, you know, maybe they overwintered with too much honey, or maybe you had a weak hive that, you know, had 60 pounds of honey in their second deep and barely ate any of it throughout the winter. So what do you do with all that old honey? It may even be honey mixed with syrup. So what do you do with it now that we're starting to come out of winter? So, um, you know, once you have daytime temperatures in the 60s, uh, that's when you can do something about this old excess honey. You know, once you're within a couple weeks of, of a significant nectar flow coming in, 
uh, you know, again, for the South, that's kind of like now, if you're in the northern half of the United States, you might be a month from that. But once your daytime temperatures are consistently in the 60s, um, if you have a hive that is less than a deep box full of bees and has more than 50 pounds of honey in the second box, it's really unlikely they're going to consume all that honey. Um, if a strong hive has so much honey and there, that there's nowhere for the queen to lay, you also need to make room for that queen to lay. So what I do is, um, you know, again, I really only take action on this if I've got like three or four frames of capped honey in my bottom box. And then my second brood box is almost completely full. I, that's not enough room for that queen to lay. You know, that queen needs multiple frames to expand and lay into. So what I would do in that case is I would transfer some of that excess honey to other hungry hives. So if I have weaker hives that don't have a whole lot of honey, I'm going to take maybe four or five frames out of the middle of that top box. And I'm going to spread it out to weaker hives. And then I'm going to take empty frames from those weaker hives and put them back in that top box. So the queen has room to go up and start laying. If I don't have weaker hives, um, I can I will pull those frames of honey out and then I'll put them out and 20, 30 feet away from my hives and let them rob it out and then replace those frames. You could also freeze those frames of honey and use them later in the year for feed. Uh, and then if you have empty drawn out comb to put back in that uh, hive, you could you could empty drawn out comb back in that hive for them to start expanding. Requeening, try to requeen proactively every year. The ideal time, in my opinion, is April and May to requeen. I would say uh, we're going to talk about this quite a bit in April. I'm going to do a, when we go into the bee yard in April, I'm going to do a live demonstration of how to requeen a hive. So I'll show you that in our April webinar. In the meantime, I would check out our YouTube channel because we have several good videos on when to requeen, how to find queens, how to find queens when you can't find queens. But for today, I would say definitely, if you haven't already, please order your queens. If you want queens in early April, even mid-April, you've got to get them ordered immediately or they're not going to be available because they always sell out. We always sell out. Everybody sells out on the early dates. But I would recommend proactively requeening every year. What I do and what I, I think is easiest is when I go through and split my bees, that's when I requeen. So I split everything and requeen everything at the same time. Uh, I would just note too, if you are um, buying bees for the first time this year from us, they're all gonna have new queens. So you don't have to worry about requeening until 2024. I love this quick video from uh, Dr. Ellis. So I'm gonna share uh, his opinion on how often you should requeen. Uh, your beehive. So you didn't just hear it from me. You also heard it from Dr. Ellis. Here you go. Beekeepers in the U.S. report that queen uh, quality is one of the leading causes of stress in their hives. And it's not just the fact that queens are good or bad. It's, it's also partly the fact that queen longevity is not as great, at least a lot of beekeepers report as it has been in years in the past. So this brings up a regular question. How often should I requeen my colony? The general recommendation is requeening colonies is um, advisable at least once per year. I usually say once per year. You really want a new, young, uh, vibrant, vigorous queen in your colonies usually in super early spring because she's going to be the one who's producing lots of eggs, therefore lots of brood to carry your colony through production season. So I think requeening once per year is advisable. Now, let me give you a little secret. Even as a beekeeper, I've faced this myself. Some of us are so happy to just have a queen that we will allow the queen to stay in that hive, whether she is good or bad. And I certainly don't recommend that. We need to have strong, productive queens in our hive. So if whatever reason you think your queen is underperforming, you should requeen her as well. So I said requeen once a year, but a queen can go bad. She might die. She might disappear. She might not be productive. So you have to be willing to solve future problems by requeening as often as necessary if requeening once a year um, wasn't enough for a particular colony. Awesome advice as, as always. So I love, love that perspective. Okay. So, um, so with, 
with that, um, we are going to jump over to um, Chris Barnes. So Chris is speaking tonight to us about swarms and bee removals. And he's a he's an authority on the subject. Chris does a lot of bee removals. He's caught, I'm sure, thousands of swarms. It's a super relevant topic as we go into swarm and removal season. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Chris and um, let him share his screen and uh, and let him take it away. So thank you, Chris. This size correctly. Okay. Um, I want to make sure everybody is everybody seeing this the presentation that says collecting swarms and other bee removals. Yep, we got it, Chris. Okay, all right. Um, how long do I have, Blake? You said like an hour and a half. <laughs> I wish, Chris. Uh, you got about thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay. I um, I will try to push through and get this done in that amount of time. Okay. Um, this to me is a timely presentation to do because we're, as was already mentioned, uh, spring for those of us here in Texas and in the South is coming pretty early. And um, I'm already starting to get some calls for swarms or um, places where bees are, and they were actually there all winter, but people didn't notice them during the winter. Um, but now the bees are active and people are calling me to, to help them get their bees out. So um, that's what this is about. So um, why would somebody want to collect swarms or, or do a bee removal? Um, and to me, the first thing is, is that people are gonna call you anyway. Um, as soon as they find out that you're a beekeeper, um, your friends and your neighbors, uh, you're the first person they're gonna call to come help get these bees out. In fact, sometimes if you're close enough to them, they may blame you and think that they're your bees. Um, and if you're hive swarm, they might be your bees. Um, so uh, people are gonna call you and you know it's good to help out your friends and family and, and even other people that you may not know. Um, you may also want to uh, grow your apiary. Uh, anytime you can go and collect bees, that you know you're not paying for or having to do a split. Um, it can be a way to add more hives to uh, the number of hives you have in your apiary. Um, make a little money is one of the other reasons. Um, when I first got started, uh, I was pretty cheap and um, I bought my first nuke, but then I found out that you know people will pay you to get bees out of the walls of their houses. Um, so I thought, oh, this is cool. This is a way to get free bees. Well, th there's no such thing as free bees um, because you're still working for it and, you know, time and effort is worth money. Um, but, you know, if you can get paid to collect bees, um, it can be something that is worthwhile. Uh, for me, it actually became part of a retirement income. Um, the other thing that we like to do is it, it's a way to encourage uh, the public to save bees rather than exterminating them. Um, there's a lot of the public that their first reaction when they see honeybees, especially if they're swarming and flying around, is to grab a can of raid or call somebody to pest control to come in and kill them out. Um, and then the last reason is it's actually pretty fun. I'm going to pause this one say <laughs> beekeepers shouldn't have allergies so excuse me for that um it's actually pretty fun to catch bees uh, especially swarms um i mentioned that i i do get paid to do removals but personally i don't charge to catch swarms uh it doesn't take me that long i do them fast um and it's just a an easy way and frankly uh, i have a blast doing it so um before we get into actually how you catch swarms, I want to separate and make sure we're talking about the right thing. Um, and the first thing is that there's kind of two categories of bee removals. Um, and I've talked to some other friends and they pretty much agree that they er, everything falls into one of these two groups. Uh, there's something called structural removals. Um, that's where you actually have a, a colony of bees inside a wall or the soffit and fascia of your house or under your floor. Um, basically, anytime 
that there's comb where you have to use a saw to get to it and cut into a structure. Um, that would include anything that, you know, where there's a wall that might have electricity or plumbing running through the wall. Um, the other type of bee removal are what we call non-structural removals. Um, swarms fall into that category, but water, reme water meter removals, open air colonies, and forced abscons also fall into that category. Um, and the real biggest difference is in the tools and the skill set that is needed to remove bees from that. Um, for most structural removals, it takes a pretty specialized set of skills. Um, you almost have to be a carpenter um, for quite a few things. Um, and then you need a whole bunch more tools, uh, several different types of ladders some scaffolding. I'm just trying to think of the things that I have. Uh, different BVACs, um, hammers, saws. I probably have five or six different kinds of saws, uh, chisels to get through brick and that kind of thing. Uh, Non-structural removals are things that um, almost any beekeeper is going to have the tools that are needed to get those bees out. Uh, even if it's a, a open air colony where there's actual comb, um, if you have a fillet knife and a hive tool, uh, those are probably going to be some of the only tools you, you really need to get those kind of uh, to get those bees out of that kind of a uh, area. Um, catching swarms in particular, I've got uh, several slides later on where I talk about the different kinds of uh, tools and equipment that you probably ought to have with you if you're wanting to be prepared to go get swarms. Um, one of the keys is when you when somebody calls you to get bees out of something um, is you have to know your limitations. Uh, and I kind of stole this from uh, Clint Eastwood's um, Dirty Harry movie, uh, Man's Got to Know His Limitations. Uh, even for somebody like myself that does bee removals professionally, um, there are times where I will look at a situation and say, you know what, this particular removal is something that is outside of my skill set. Uh, usually it's a good example of that is if somebody calls me and bees are going behind uh, an electrical panel, um, I personally don't mess with bees that are that close to that kind of electricity that can kill me. Um, most people around here in Texas uh, know who Steve Butler is. Uh, Steve Butler does professional bee removals, but he's also a licensed electrician. So for those kind of jobs, I call Steve and have him come do those removals. Um, I limit myself from doing those because it's not something I want to get into. Um, it's one of those things that you have to decide what your knowledge and skill level is and what your tool set is and what you're willing to do. Um, so the first thing that we I really want to touch on before I get into stuff is do you need a license to do bee removals in the state of Texas? Uh, and when I made this presentation, I was thinking Texas Bee Supply, they, they're in Texas, but now it's the Bee Supply. So we probably have people from all of the United States uh, watching this webinar. Um, Texas currently does not have, uh, require a license to do bee removals. Uh, anybody that wants to hang their shingle up and start a business can go out and, and start removing bees. Uh, that is not the case in other states. Uh, I know for, for sure Georgia just passed a law where you have to have a license to do it. Um, even if you're not required to have a license, that doesn't mean there aren't rules. Uh, in Texas specifically, if you cross county lines with your bees, you still need the annual bee removal transportation permit from the Texas Apiary Inspection Service. Um, that's sometimes called, well, it's not really a bee removal, it's more just bee transportation permit. Um, and it, the purpose in this permit was to help reduce um, the spread of various bee diseases from one county to another. Um, but it still applies to people that are removing bees. 
Uh, and if you're in different parts of Texas, you may be in West Texas and you don't have to cross county lines. Uh, on the other hand, if you're up in Northeast Texas, for example, uh, Rockwell County is pretty small. Uh, you can drive for 15 minutes and cross county lines. Um, so they do require that permit. If you're crossing county lines with your bees, um, if you go to their website uh, for the forms and fees page, it's this section that says bee removal transportation application. Uh, and in order to get that, you have to be registered uh, as an apiary with the Texas Apiary Inspection Service. Um, before we move in, I want to quickly mention that uh, in Texas, there have been some attempts to pass uh, government regulation uh, requiring licensing for bee removal. Uh, and some of those attempts were not always fair or reasonable. Um, I think the last attempt was back in 2017 when the Texas legislature was in session. And uh, the attempt was pretty much um, to require, I think, 600 hours of education. And it was only going to be taught by one person who everybody had to pay him to attend his classes. Uh, it was pretty much a, a money grab for those of us that do bee removals. Um, as a result, in 2021, uh, a group of professional bee removers formed the Texas Association of Professional Bee Removers, um, where the goal was pretty much protecting the interests of bee removers, as well as ensuring that those who remove bees do so in a way that serves the public good. Um, we do things in a professional and ethical manner. Um, you can see our website there, it's uh, txappr.org. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things for this. The first page is for people looking for bee removals. Um, all of our members are listed on there. So if you join the association, um, people can find you so that if they have bees that need removed, they can locate you. Um, the other uh, thing that we try to do is for people that do join, we try to provide some uh, benefits to them. For example, uh, besides just the advertising aspect of it, uh, for example, we work with insurance companies to help provide the correct coverage at discounted costs. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, this is probably the part that y'all really wanted to see. It's how to remove and collect swarms. Um, we're not going to talk about the other types of removals, whether it's structural or even forced abscons. Those are entire other classes that we can talk about at another date. Um, swarms in particular, just as a definition, is a collection of worker bees surrounding a queen that have left their original hive and are seeking a new home. It's how the colony does full colony reproduction. Um, it's part of their natural instinct. Um, a couple of uh, key parts about swarms is that they have no brood, no honey, no pollen, and no comb. Uh, literally, the, the worker bees gorge themselves on honey before they leave so that when they go out and start looking for a new home, they can immediately start building um, comb. Um, as a result of them not having no food or brood, um, they're usually very docile and gentle. Um, mo and I say usually, uh, most swarms um, I can collect without a lot of extra bee suits and protective coverings. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I recommend people do it when they first start out. Uh, I always tell people to suit up to start with and then... If the bees allow you to remove that stuff, you can. Um, swarms can collect on virtually any surface. Uh, and I've got pictures to show the different types of swarms here in a second. Uh, and they can be at any height. Um, we've seen swarms. I, I've personally seen swarms up about 125 feet up in the air on a light stanchion in a football field. Um, I also see them crawling around on the ground. Um, usually from a clipped, clipped queen that's from a, a hive that somebody was managing. 
Um, one of the other key points to a swarm is that they usually only stay in a location for between 12 to 48 hours. Uh, and that can be as little as 30 minutes. It can be, well, if a, if a swarm looks for a new place to, to move into a colony and they don't find it, that's usually how open air colonies start. Um, so they might not ever leave. But typically that ball of bees that you see, uh, the swarm colony that is the typical thing, will only be there for half to two days. A um, couple of things about long-term swarm management before we get into actually how to collect them. Um, I don't know about Blake or Sherry's um, recommendation, but personally, I don't recommend swarms as a new beekeeper's first hive. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that is one, um, you don't know the genetics of the bees that you're getting. Um, you don't know the age of the queen. Um, in fact, it's most likely that that queen is at least one year old. Uh, and as you heard Jamie Ellis talk about requeening your hive every year is kind of a good thing because you want a fresh queen. Um, but then the other thing people don't talk about is new beekeepers it's really useful to get your bees on your timetable. Um, so new beekeepers for your first hives, you're better off starting out buying a nuke of bees, or actually I recommend two nukes. You, that's a different subject, but two hives is better to start with than one. Um, I mentioned the genetics. Um, this is more of an issue for people down here in Texas than it is up uh, further north. Um, but we do have Africanized bees here in Texas. Uh, they've been here for, what, 30 years now. Uh, they're pretty well established. Um, Africanized swarms are still pretty gentle and docile. Uh, you may not know it. Um, so you'll get them home, and you won't know that they're Africanized until they move into their home, and they start building comb, and now they start acting defensive because they haven't uh, something to be defensive of. Um, so anytime I collect a swarm or do any removal for that matter, I usually give my, those bees a pretty short leash on how long it is before I am ready to requeen them. Um, you know, and that could be anything from if the queen's not as productive as you like, the age issue, or if the temperament isn't as gentle as you like. Um, so let's let's look at some of these swarms real quick. Um, I mentioned that they can collect on anything. Um, the picture on the left is on a tree branch. And as you can tell, that's probably, that's a huge swarm. Uh, in fact, that's probably multiple swarms. Um, swarms produce uh, some pheromones so that the bees can orient and collect together. Well, one swarm pheromone will attract another swarm. And so sometimes you get multiple swarms collecting all together. I don't know, that's not a picture I took, but it's possible you could have as many as 10 different queens in that one big swarm pile. Uh, so it's technically not one swarm, it's 10. Um, but they can be huge, as you can tell from that. Um, they On the middle picture, they collected on a swing set. Um, I actually took the picture that's on the, third on the far right, uh, that's in a barbecue pit. Um, one of the things when your friends call you about a swarm, um, they're, they don't really know what a lot of bees means. So the one, the picture on the right in the barbecue pit, they told me that they had a massive swarm in their barbecue pit. And I went and looked at it and eh, it's about half the size of a volleyball. Uh, if I had to guess, that's probably right up about the size of a package of bees. So about 3,000 bees or three pounds of bees. Um, it's by no means massive. It's uh, about what you get for a starter size hive. Um, the bees, you know, they can collect on anything. So you have to be prepared to handle different situations. Uh, so if, if you're good at collecting bees in one type of situation, like on a tree branch, that may not be very useful if they're on a barbed wire fence or a chain link fence or, uh, on a fire hydrant 
or on the side of a brick wall. Um, you know, I, everybody loves the bees that collect on a tree branch like that because uh, typically I can just take a, a box, hold it up underneath them, and I'll actually take a pair of uh, clippers and clip the tree branch and let the whole branch fall into the box. I'll put the lid on and I'll have collected the whole swarm in maybe 15, 20 seconds. Um, whereas the chain link fence, if I were to try to collect those, I can't shake the fence. And if even if I could and knock the bees down, I don't know what side to put my box on because I don't know which side the bees are going to fall into. Um, you know, and the same thing with the, the fire hydrant. Um, for those, I would actually probably use a BVAC, which I don't use a BVAC for everything, but a BVAC is useful for things like that. Um, I will, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and mention that people have different methods of collecting bees, uh, swarms. Um, some people will shake the bees and then spend a ton of time looking for the queen. And then they'll put the queen in the clip and let the bees march into the box. Um, I take a little bit of a different approach. Um, my approach is I want the bees in mass in a box as quickly as I possibly can. So like the bees on the tree branch, if I can get them in a box in 20 seconds, I'm not going to look for the queen at all. Uh, I'm going to put them in the box. I'm going to take them home, get them in my hive box, and then probably five to seven days later, go in and start looking for the queen and make sure they're viable. But if you have a swarm that looks like that and you get all of them falling in the box, you've got the queen. Uh, you don't really have to go looking for her. Um, I know to some people that's probably heresy, but that's okay. We all have a different way of doing things. Okay, so I've got a couple of rules uh, and these are Chris's rules for catching swarms. Uh, the first rule is when somebody calls you, have everything in your car ready before you get the call. Um, I've got my truck. Uh, I have all of these other tools or most of these tools that we're about to see. Uh, they sit in the back seat of my truck um, pretty much from now until uh, swarm season will usually end about June here in Texas. So I'll keep them there through early July. Um, and as I use some of that stuff, I will replace it immediately because I've had two or three swarm calls in a single day before. Uh, the second rule of catching swarms is when you get a call, be willing to drop everything and go get it right now. Um, I mentioned that, you know, swarms typically last from 12 to 48 hours. Uh, that's a very loose estimation. It's not a rule. It's kind of a guideline. Um, so it, I, I can't tell you how disappointing it is to get a call for a swarm and I piddle around in my house and I get stuff together and I finally get out to that place where they're at and I drive up and I see a ball of bees about the size of a tennis ball. And the people say, well, if you'd have been here 20 minutes ago, they were the size of a basketball. Uh, that means that they found a place to move into and flew off. So I just lost my swarm. Um, and I and I spent all the time working to get the swarm, and I didn't get the reward for it. Um, so if you if you can't go to get them right now, you're better off calling somebody else that can than saying, "Well, if they're still there tomorrow, I'll come get them tomorrow," uh, because they probably won't be there tomorrow. So, what equipment do you need? I've mentioned this several times. Um, the first thing is you need something to put the bees in. And it can be literally anything as long as you can close it tight so that while you're driving them home, they're not flying around the inside of your car, um, which I've had that happen too. Um, you know, a lot of people use nuke boxes um, or full-size high bodies. Um, if you do a high body, I recommend using two lids, both top and bottom. That way the bees don't just get out through the bottom. Um, the last couple of years, I just use a plastic tub. Um, they're cheap. Uh, get them at Lowe's, Walmart, wherever. 
Um, they're big that so that if I get a big swarm, I can get the whole swarm and knock them all in at one time, but they're very lightweight, so I can hold it with one hand. So I can hold the tub with one hand, grab the tree branch and shake it with the other hand, and then immediately put the lid on. And I don't have a lot of bees flying all over the place um, trying to get disorganized. Um, it doesn't have to be one of these. Uh, back when I had a, a full-time job, um, I went through, I got a call while I was at the office and I went and pulled uh, a box of paper like you run through a copy machine. I dumped all the reams of paper out and I just used the box and literally punched a hole in it so that the bees could come in that way. Uh, okay, other equipment stuff that you need. Um, there's obvious stuff. Probably want to keep your bee suit around. Um, like I said, bees generally are pretty gentle, but you do want to start with the bee suit on. Uh, you know, as soon as I say they're all gentle, somebody's going to get lit up by a swarm somewhere. Um, I do keep some ladders because uh, I like being able to get some bees that are a little bit high. Um, the ladder I keep in the back of my truck is just a 10 foot step ladder. Um, if they're higher than that, I generally don't mess with trying to catch swarms. I know that there's lots of people that have buckets on poles and they reach 20 feet up in the air and if they want to go through all that work and keep that equipment that's great they can have those swarms um i catch enough of them that i take the easy cherry picking ones um if you do have a ladder make sure that you don't have it like the picture over here on the right where you know people are falling down you don't have to be osha approved but you don't want to get yourself hurt um other tools, I've kind of mentioned this before, uh, both loppers or little hand clippers uh, for brush. Um, sometimes that's to just get brush out of the way. Sometimes that's so that you can just take the whole branch of bees and clip them uh, as long as the homeowner or property owner is okay with that. Um, a bee vac, I mentioned that before. Uh, it doesn't have to be a fancy one like that one. Uh, it can be a homemade bee vac or one that you borrow from somebody. Um, a little battery powered saw is sometimes handy if loppers don't work. Uh, and then just regular beekeeping equipment, a smoker, a bee brush, hive tools, um, things like that. Um, some of the other things that I keep in my truck that people may not know about, um, I usually keep a jar and a spray bottle of something called Honey Bee Gone. Um, it doesn't have to be that brand in particular. Uh, there's other ones, Bego. Um, it's the stuff that you, eating bee supply company will sell that you can put on top of a, a rag for a honey super to drive the bees out of a honey super. Um, the way I use that is after I get bee, if I have to shake bees out of a tree uh, and they're in the box, well, the box will have most of the bees, but there's still going to be some flying around. So I'll spray a little bit of honey bee gone on the branch where the bees were. And now the bees flying around don't like that smell and they'll go to the box where the queen is and they'll find her a lot faster. Um, same thing with swarm commander. Uh, if I'm using a box and I'm just letting the bees march in, uh, a little drop of swarm commander is a good thing. Um, you have to be careful with swarm lures like that because you can overuse them. And if you overuse them, they act as a repellent. Um, I do mention that uh, I don't spend a lot of time looking for the queen, but I do have a queen clip with me. Uh, if I do see her, I'll get her in the clip. And if you get the queen in a clip and put her in the box, um, you can leave your collection box there and come back two hours later and the bees will have all moved in for you. Um, the, I'll talk about the, the third picture, the fourth picture in a minute. The picture on the far right is probably the best tool you can have. It's a frame of built out comb. Um, that's actually a better swarm lure than anything uh, you can buy in a bottle. Um, and it's especially useful if you have a swarm of bees on an unstructured thing that you can't shake or there's lots of contours to it. Uh, if you just lay that 
frame of honeycomb on top of the swarm, eventually the bees will start collecting on the honeycomb because they'll like that. Uh, and then you can pick up the whole honeycomb, the whole frame, move it into your box. And um, you may have to do that two or three times, but at least it gives you something to grab. Um, the fourth picture, the one at the bottom, the, uh, I don't know if you see me moving my mouse there. It's a kitchen spatula. It's actually a commercial kitchen spatula. Um, I got mine when I was in high school because I worked in a, as a short order cook flipping pancakes for a, a breakfast place. Um, I mentioned that I like to catch my bees as fast as possible. If the bees are swarmed on something that's a smooth surface, um, you can put your box under it and literally just scrape the bees in in one motion and literally collect the whole swarm in seconds. Uh, all the bees go in. You don't have any flyers. Um, you know, you might want to practice flipping pancakes in your kitchen for a while to get used with the spatula, but it's pretty easy and it's a cheap little tool to keep in there. It's one of the things that I always have. Um, so uh, now that, you know, we've gone through uh, the different kinds of swarms and different types of tools, what do you do? And this is where most people start getting into problems what do you do to keep your swarm to stay at your home uh and the key to getting a swarm or even a bee removal where you're doing the structure cut out uh to make your new hive their home is the queen um if the queen is stable and she's already mated and she starts laying eggs in the new hive once she starts laying eggs in the new hive that's their home they're not going anywhere um, most people or some people will lock the queen up, uh, using a queen clip. They'll keep the queen in a clip for three or four days. Uh, some people use queen excluders. Um, again, that, that frame of comb that I used, if you can give that swarm, even just a single frame that's got some built out comb, maybe with a little bit of honey on it. Not a lot of honey. You don't need to feed them because they gorged on honey. They're full of honey. Um, and a little bit of brood. Um, that brood has its own pheromones and the queen will want to stay with those with the brood. Uh, it's just like when you're doing hive inspections and you want to find the queen, the queen is almost always going to be next to the brood. Well, if you give her brood, the queen's going to stay there and she's not going to want to fly away and leave. Um, one of the, the other things that people will use, and, and I will sometimes do this too, and this is a picture of a, it's a dial that goes as your entrance. Uh, this is on a nuke box, but you can put it on a full-size hive as well. Um, these are really useful because, um, if the bees are in this box, uh, you put your lid on, you can close it so that they just get ventilation from the air one and they're not flying around inside your car. Then you can turn it so that this one is here. That's the queen excluder, so that the workers can come and go, but the queen stays in. Uh, and then it, when they're ready, you can open it up and all the bees can come and go. Um, one of the reasons I don't personally like locking my queens up is that sometimes when you catch a swarm, those queens are virgin queens. Uh, they're secondary or tertiary swarms they came from the original hive. Well, you don't want to lock a virgin queen up because she still needs to take her mating flight. Um, okay, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna show these videos, but um, I imagine that uh, later on you can come and click on this link on uh, Text Bee Supplies website or this video. Uh, these are some swarms that I've done. Uh, I, I just have a couple of them. I'm probably gonna video some more. Uh, just so that we have more different types of situations. Um, but one of them is one where I used my spatula and scraped the bees in and it was done in seconds. Uh, so th that's that's my presentation. That was great, man. Thank you so much, Chris. I mean, that was that was phenomenal. I, I love the I love the tip about um, using uh, comb as a swarm um, 
as a swarm uh, lure. And, and I totally agree with that. You know, swarms just love comb. Um, so many great points. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, we will um, be sending out an email with a webinar link uh, for next month. It says March, mid April. Um, we are just a heads up to, um, we, I don't know if it's going to happen in April, but I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, we are going to start experimenting with doing these webinars on YouTube live um, instead of Zoom. It'll be a little bit easier to get into. You'll just have to go to our YouTube channel. On your end, nothing will change. You'll still get a reminder email. It'll still have a link to follow. Um, you'll just follow a link just like you always do. But when you get there, it, it, it'll be YouTube live instead of uh, Zoom. We're still experimenting with it. I think it has some features that are going to be better and easier for everybody. Um, so uh, again, I think that's going to be in April. Don't be shocked if you follow the link and it's like, oh, this isn't Zoom. This is YouTube. Uh, but it'll still be the same webinar live. Uh, but we're, we're going to start playing with that soon. Um, and we'll also have a link in that email to the uh, Be Supply monthly magazine, products and videos we've referenced, et cetera. So um, with that, thanks for your time. It's always great to hang out with you guys. And then uh, we will see you in April. Have a great evening. Bye.